is there an opportunity where we might just reduce the mix time a little bit and maybe um, them having them without an impact in their performance? And um, so we were trying to play with that. And also we were wanting to test different markers. Hello, how are you all doing today? Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host today, Kelly Walmsley, and I'm joined by the lovely Dr. Andrea Rubio. Hi, Andrea. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me today. It's been fun kind of watching you in your career so far that you've had. Um, I've got to kind of watch you from on the outside and seeing many of your presentations um, and winning many, many awards at Poultry Science Association and uh, <laughs> some of the other meetings. And so you've got, um, you have a lot of research under your belt. Um, guess, give us a little bit about your background first, if you don't mind. Thank you. So again, you know, my name is Andrea Rubio. Um, I'm originally from Honduras and I started my poultry journey was not uh, very traditional, I would say. I was very into ruminants when I was in my undergrad, in my senior year. Um, I knew I wanted to do dairy and not even nutrition. I wanted to do reproduction. So I, I made an interesting shift in my career when I um, got an opportunity to do an internship um, at LSU. And it was a it was a very um, kind of destiny because Dr. Theresa Laverne was there. She was a faculty at LSU at that time. And Ariel Bergeron, she was there too, and she was in her senior year as well. So I kind of um, started working with her in the lab, kind of helping her a little bit. And I, I got into poultry um, that way. I came um, after that. I came to do a master's uh, with Dr. Wilmer Pacheco, and he he was finishing up his PhD work at NC State, and he was um, getting ready to be a faculty at Auburn. So I came in 2016 to start my master's. Um, I got my master's in poultry science in there, and he uh, was kind of the first person to kind of introduce me to the whole broiler nutrition, but also incorporating uh, feed manufacturing. So after I got that little exposure, I did some particle size studies and um, and some pelleting, working some uh, with some micro pellets as well. So I wanted to kind of go ahead and learn a little bit more on the feed side. So when I was looking to do my PhD work, um, I um, Dr. Farnholz, Adam Farnholz at NC State, he had a um, he had a spot and. Actually, he had his senior student, JT Pope, at that time he was, I think JT was in his um, final semester by the time I was getting there. So it was a good um, kind of transition. I got I got into the lab and, and obviously tried to learn a little bit more about how the feed mill side work. And um, he was uh, one of the feed mill experts. So, you know, I it was a good opportunity to me and, and kind of keep on that track. And then from there, I, I finished my PhD two years ago, and, and a lot of the things that I did was um, basically on mixing and pelleting and how that has an impact in, in broiler nutrition. Thank you for, for that. And that and that's a, a great lineage that you have. And especially I had forgotten about the LSU connection that you have. And um, <laughs> those are some great poultry nutritionist ladies that I, I um I often uh, lo love to chat up with. So <laughs> yes, yes, it was it was really good because now you know um, it's been how the journey goes. You said they say that the industry is small. It's really small because you know now mm -hmm. I get to work with Ariel. Some some things here in North Carolina. She's um, um, she's not working for a company, so you know you never know who you will find ahead in your career. So, so yeah, it's been good. Well, good. Um, so let's talk, let's dive into it and talk a little bit about um, your project and um, looking at some different ways to assess uh, mixer CV and um, then also the impact on broiler performance. So can you give a little bit of, a, I guess, kind of an intro on the importance of that? Yeah, so um, when we were kind of, you know, um, thinking on the projects, um, we usually get the questions by, you know, either feed meal managers or sometimes nutritionists. Um, if there's a specific time that we have to mix feed form or, you know, how long do I have to mix my feed so I know that 
I'm getting a uniform blend or even sometimes, you know, how do I measure the variation in my mixer and all those type of things. So um, there were a couple of studies that were done um, in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, good studies were, you know, they were testing mixers, uh, mixer CVs. They were using different markers. Um, sometimes they were doing different times as well. Um, and there, um, there was, a, I think we needed kind of new data on obviously some of the new mixers that we have now and maybe, you know, keeping if the same assays that we use to address that variation when we're mixing feed, is that um, the same? Or maybe, you know, we need to go in a different direction. Um, so when we were coming up with the, with the studies, uh, one of the things that we wanted is, you know, time. Is there, you know, is it possible for us to kind of um, maybe reduce slightly the mixing time just because we know that, you know, feed mills now, obviously, um, there's a need for being efficient when you're making feed. So is there a way where there, is there an opportunity where we can actually kind of maybe reduce mix time, especially for meat birds where, you know, they're producing a lot of feed and maybe when the birds are having those periods where they're um, having a higher feed consumption, is there an opportunity where we might just reduce the mix time a little bit and maybe um, them having them without an impact in their performance? And um, so we were trying to play with that. And also we were wanting to test different markers. Um, obviously, when you're testing markers for testing that variation in the blend and in the mix, um, you can do, there are a lot of options that you can use. Um, obviously, we have salt, the salt method. Um, I wanted to try, we wanted to try the um, iron color particles to see how that works, because um, obviously you wanted to find something that was um, single source, uh, where not other things are coming from the diet within the analysis that you are doing. Um, and then we wanted to include some enzymes. So we were wanting to test, you know, just to try uh, whatever opportunity we had to test for CV. And that was kind of the idea when we were um, coming up with these projects. And then uh, we had the opportunity to play a little with NIR technology. You know, NIR, um, even though it's not a, a very new technology, it's been out for a while. Um, there are a lot of applications that I think in the animal industry are, are interesting. And they are already, you know, doing NIR with particle size, um, obviously NIR for nutrient analysis and all that. So we wanted to give it a try. And we kind of use an inland NIR to see if we, hey, you know, instead of running assays, can we actually determine the variation in line at the same time while we're just, you know, making feeds. So we, we were kind of playing with that as well. Right. Ready for more sustainable poultry production? New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. Yeah, really cool, really practical research. Um, I enjoyed looking into this more, and um, definitely, um, like I said, like you said, it's it's a needed area, and there's a lot of different ways that you can test for, or a lot of markers that you can use, and there being a lot of variability too um, with those. So, uh, looking at an interesting on the NIR um, aspect and inline NIR. So, what did you guys see? in being able to match that up with some of the markers that you use? Yeah, so when we were um, doing the inlay NIR, um, there were a couple of things that we were trying to tweak in the system when we were getting the data. Obviously, we wanted to see, you know, what happens if we throw a batch into the mixer and we only mix it for like 30 seconds and then, you know, collect NIR readings then. And then what would happen if, well, you know, we go from 30 seconds, let's do full five minutes. Would that be any different? Um, so when we were um, using the inline NIR, we kind of did that. And we also played a little bit with the volumes in the mixer. Maybe, you know, what happens if, if it's only halfway full? Will the NIR, the probe that it's in line, getting the readings? Because um, the readings were taken from the discharge conveyor. So basically once the mixer open um, and that feed was moving through the conveyor. 
that's where the kind of the window and we install the probe to get the readings out. So it was very interesting to see that, you know, having the NIR, um, when we were collecting the data that was going to the computer and kind of seeing the spectra, um, it was interesting to see how uh, probably particle size play a role in there because in our case, um, at least in the in as when we were making the feed, if you use a particle size of corn that was too fine, then the conveyor will plug on us. So yeah, by plugging, you know, we were collecting readings, but the readings were not taking maybe as um, flow. They were not flowing as maybe you wanted to. Sure. So it was interesting because for those diets specifically where we were collecting those data. Um, we were using a coarser corn particle side because we knew it was going to flow a lot better without stopping, and that wasn't going to interrupt the reading. So that was one of the interesting things that we did. Uh, we did not measure particle size in line, uh, but that's a factor that we kind of tweak a little bit so we were able to collect the spectra without any interruptions. And then by the time we got all the readings out from the different batches and different times, um, it was interesting to see how. You know, we use protein in this case because obviously we got a, um, a proximate analysis from the spectra in the NIR. So, you know, okay, let's grab protein because that's what we have. And it was interesting to see how when you grab protein as a marker, obviously it's not going to be a single source because there are a lot of other ingredients in the diet that will have that protein. So, you know, that's a good example of not having a marker that's not being kind of single mm -hmm. source. So we we saw that very clearly with the NIR. Um, and then as far as the analysis, you know, inline, they were pretty accurate with what we got from the lab because we sent samples to the lab to see how the analysis compared. And they were pretty similar. It was, it was um, really good. And we were able to play a little bit with the spectra. We're just getting, just getting out the spectra. And even though, you know, we couldn't use maybe a specific marker coming from the NIR, we did, um, we did see that um, having that um, protein was not necessarily um, good. But when you compare, like if you mix it only for 30 seconds, you can see that there's a little variation in the spectra of all those nutrients in there, even though obviously when you compare and you see the five minutes, you see a, a like a margin or a um, line that is a little tighter. So you see that it, there's there's actually an impact on uniformity there. So that was a, a really neat thing to see with the NIR for sure. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you think about, um, I mean, 30 seconds is a very short mix time. And that's, um, I mean, I guess you, you would get some more revolutions that would kind of be coming from that. Yeah, yeah. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today. And um, I think we'll, we might need to be able to have you back pretty soon um, to, to finish the conversation even more, expand upon more. Um, so, but I really appreciate your time, Andrea. And um, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I really enjoyed our conversations as well, Dr. Wansley. And then thank you to our listeners out there uh, for joining us today as well. And uh, that's concludes another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, um, and we'll see you next time. Bye.